there's many, many things that need to be done. So uh, I just, I'm not trying to publish, so you can download the software, you can play with it, it's free for research. Um, but just to give you a sense, what are we talking about? What, what kind of machines are these that we're building? Uh, you basically, it's a bunch of software. At the core of it, there's a runtime engine that lets you, that runs these hierarchies. There's lots of nodes that can be very big or small. And you might want to run on anything from a single core CPU on a laptop, which it'll run fine. You can run on a multi-core CPU. We can use all those cores because it's all parallel processing. And you can run on a big cluster computer, which is what we do most of our development on. Uh, this system takes care of all the details. You don't have to worry about it. It just sort of you know, makes, takes care of it. There's a second component to it, which is a bunch of tools that let you create these environments, create these hierarchies, test them, and train them. Um, there's a, we created some bunch of tools. There's a third party company that's already created some other new tools and some other people working on it. So those tool sets are getting better. Uh, and then there's a, build, there's a third component here is the learning algorithms themselves. I said it's pretty simple. You're learning sequences. It sounds really easy. It's actually not so easy. And there's several ways of doing it, and some work much better than others, and we're figuring that out as we go. So uh, you can plug in new learning algorithms as you, as you do this. Now, um, just to get a sense of what can you do with this stuff uh, and what's been happening, we think we have about 100 to 200 active developers today. These are people, we have thousands of people who downloaded it, but we think there's about somewhere between 100 and 200 who use it daily. Um, uh, this tool set. And this is a very difficult tool set to use. This is last year's tool set. We have eight corporate customers who pay us uh, money to have a very close relationship with us. The applications are all over the map, uh, what people want to do with this and what they're having success or in difficulty with. I'm just going to give you some flavor from We've been surprised at a number of people in the gaming industry um, who want to use it. For one people doing this motion capture inference, figuring out what people are doing um, as they play with a game. Um, other people doing for visual editors and so on. There's a, we're working with a major car company who's trying to use it to basically understand traffic around a car as you're driving along. You know, is a car likely to change lanes and so on? Can you predict what's going to happen in traffic? We're doing a bunch of things with voice. Um, a lot of government contractors are using it for voice speaker uh, ID and so on. A bunch of people doing a vision type applications of various types. Um, process control. It turns out you can take manufacturing data and you can feed it into this stuff and it kind of discovers what the cause is and you can do inference and figure out what's going on in there. Uh, people are trying to use it in financial markets and so on. Uh, at Numenta, we have decided to do a very high-end, a, a real good vision system as our test case. This is to test out the tools, to test out the algorithms. So we've gone from those little line drawings. We're now doing uh, sort of high-resolution uh, black and white images. Color is actually pretty easy, but we're not. We, we, we don't want to get. We want to do the harder problem, which is black and white. Um, and uh, so these are the kind of objects we are training on now. Cars, real world objects, cars and boats and binoculars and sneakers and so on. And we have a fairly sophisticated system for, for getting training data and, and so on and making movies out of it. And then you can, after the system's been trained, you can give it novel patterns. You clip them off the web. Um, and this is like, these are patterns it wasn't trained on. We say, here, what's this? And these are showing examples of images that got correct. It's these, I know all those are boats. I know those are cars. I know those are binoculars. Totally novel patterns. We're getting close to the cat and dog problem. And uh, I think we'll solve that fairly shortly, shortly within the next year or so. Um, so this is our test case, what we're, what we're doing with this stuff. Now, just to, re just to be I want you to, you can say, you know, what does this stuff do again, right? Let me t remind you what. <laughs> what it does. You build these hierarchies. You train them on data through some sort of sensory organ. It could be, it could be like vision, or it could be just financial data. And the system trains. And what it does is it discovers the causes underlying the patterns. What are the underlying causes from these sensory data coming in? It would be like discovering, if you were studying weather, it would be discovering, like, oh, there's storm fronts, or there's El Nino. You're trying to figure out what are the underlying causes of manufacturing problems, or the underlying causes of, of vision, of visual input. Once you've trained the system and it's discovered those causes, which is valuable in its own right, you can do inference. Inference is just pattern recognition. You can do spatial and temporal pattern uh, inference, or pattern recognition. The system can, make, then can do predictions. And um, prediction, believe it or not, is just the flip side of behavior. The way you generate behavior is exactly, the way the brain does it is, is exactly the way it does predictions. It's, it's essentially that pattern flowing down the hierarchy. We haven't built that. We haven't tested it yet, but we think we know how to do that. And then it's also, you can, you can use a hierarchy for attentional systems, which I didn't talk about, but when you want to do real inference on real world stuff, you have to be able to tend to different parts of the scene or different parts of the input, and it's very good at that. And of course, it can work on any kind of input. You can do like vision, auditory, tactile, human type of stuff, but it works on many non-biological problems as well. This is the basic of it. It's a very fundamental computing paradigm. Um, the question that we could ask here, does it solve the issues that AI has, solved, has dealt with? And I believe it does. The first issue was one of efficiency. Remember, we had to store lots of knowledge of the world. It didn't seem possible. Well, HTMs, hierarchical temporal memories, are very efficient. And the reason is, is because of the hierarchy. Things lower down in the hierarchy are reused at the next level up, and those are reused at the next level up. 
So if I've spent a lot of time learning what certain animals look like, and, and then I'm exposed to a new animal, it's likely going to have fur or skin or scales or feet or eyes and so on. And I don't have to learn all that stuff again. The, the low-level structure of the world is consistent across these things. It's, it's not like some new, completely new patterns. And so we, we basically we use that. And it makes, the, it makes the storage very efficient, and it makes the time to train very efficient. What you discover when you start working with HTMs is that when you first start training them, it takes a long time to get the first few layers trained, but then it gets much, much faster. It's just like a human. You spend many years basically look like you're not learning anything. Um, there's a little baby, but you're actually forming the foundation of this hierarchy, and then the learning gets very rapid after that, and that's the way these systems work. The second problem of, of AI knowledge representation was one of knowing what to store. And these systems are self-learning. You don't get to choose. You don't get to pick, this is the knowledge I'm going to extract from the world. It extracts it on its own, and, um, and that's a good thing, because we wouldn't know how to do that. And the third thing is, how do you get the information in a way that's, that's um, useful? You know, what's the structure of it? And uh, HTMs generalize. They generalize in many different ways. And, they, and the way they do that is, is the way the data is stored is not ad hoc. You don't get a choice where it goes. Remember on the paper tape, you know, you can stick information anywhere you want. Here you don't get that choice. And the way it's structured is a way that it gets to reuse elements in the hierarchy, and it solves those problems. It's a, the last point on this slide, um, it's just, I want to, some of the you know, math people in the room might appreciate this. Um, there's a thing called the no free lunch theorem which says that no learning algorithm can be better than all other learning algorithms for all problems. 